go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody who is joining. Um, I am Emily Trieste. I am the events marketing coordinator here at Meetup. And today we are joined by special guest, Frank Mortimer. He is the author of Bee People and the Bugs They Love. He will take us through a fact-filled journey into the world of bees. And you will hear about the loving practice of beekeeping and why it is more than just a hobby. You'll also learn about the different types and uses of honey. So before we get into it, I'm just gonna share a few slides. So the first is the event guidelines. So this event is recorded, but don't worry, you will not appear in the video. You can only see us, we can't see you. There is a mute courtesy, so your audio will be muted during this event. But if you have questions, just submit them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And closed captioning is also available. To turn it on, just click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select your preferences from there. So for today's agenda, we're just doing quick introduction right now, followed by a presentation with Frank and then a Q&A session at the end. So just to give a quick introduction to Frank, Frank is the author of Bee People and the Bugs They Love. He is an adjunct instructor at Cornell University Master's Beekeeping Program. He is a master beekeeper and he has written multiple articles featured widely in widely circulated bee culture magazine. Frank has led beekeeping seminars across the Northeast and at the New York Botanical Garden. And in addition, he has successfully campaigned for his hometown of Bridgewood to become New Jersey's first bee city USA. Frank is married, has three children, and beekeeping is something they all love to do together. So thank you, Frank, for being here. I can't wait to see what you have for us and I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna just uh, get my PowerPoint going and you can see that, right? Yep, we can see it. Excellent. Um, well, to everybody, especially for those around the world, I want to say thank you for, for joining me. And um, we're going to cover some of the very basics of beekeeping and uh, get into some of the exciting facts about honeybees. So the number one thing I always like to start with is that honeybees are gentle. And if you let them be, they'll let you be. This picture was taken of a bee on my finger in my car. And uh, which always kind of cracks me up that, you know, my first thought was, oh, grab the phone and get a picture. Um, and the thing to show here is that the bee is not stinging me. It's in no way uh, trying to hurt me. And they're just a very mental, um, a very mellow creature. So just let them be and you'll be fine. There's two things I like for everyone to remember about bees. The first is that a lot of times we, we call all flying insects bees. And honeybees, as I've said, are gentle, but it's a lot of the wasps and hornets that sting people the most. The best way to tell the difference is that the yellow jacket wasp and hornets are smooth. They look like they're made of plastic. Honeybees are fuzzy. They actually have hair over their entire body. They even have tiny um, hairs growing out of their eye. So just remember, fuzzy good, plastic bad. Fuzzy good, plastic bad. The second thing is that one third of the food we eat uh, comes from the honeybees, and that's through the pollination services that they do. And lots, mostly all the really tasty foods that we love, that's thanks to the honeybee. So here are some photos of different fruits like apples and oranges, berries like strawberries and blueberries, and then also almonds at the bottom. Almonds is a $7.6 billion industry. 80% of the world's almonds come from Northern California, and all of those almonds have to be pollinated by honeybees. So people ask me, why am I into beekeeping? Um, and the truth is, is that these are all my kids and beekeeping is what defines my family. It's what we do together. Many of you might uh, sh shoot baskets or play catch or, or go golfing, but for my family, it's about doing bee stuff. And uh, that's what, what, what we do on our weekends and our free time. So let's get into some of the basic bee facts. So in a hive, any hive, there's three kinds of bees. The first bee is the queen bee. There's only one per hive and she has one job and that's to lay eggs. So like when we think of a queen, we think of the royal wave and telling people what to do. But with bees, everybody works. And so what the queen's job is, is to lay these eggs. And at the peak of a season, she can lay up to 2000 eggs per day. So instead of queen, another uh, word we could call her would be the mother bee. Um, or the egg layer. 
And now um, she'll live up to two to four years. Most beekeepers will say two years, but theoretically she could live up to four. She's larger than the other bee. She's about one and a half times the size of the worker bee. And she has this long tail and that's how you're able to distinguish her. And when she walks, she kind of waggles her tail or, or I should say kind of sachets her tail. And so it's that different movement on the comb that helps you spot her. But just um, as another way is that beekeepers will mark their queens with special pens and then the colors correspond to what year it is. This year, because it ends in a two, the color is yellow. The second bee is the drone and the drones are the boys. They're the, um, the boy bees and they only have one job. If kids are on here, I would say they marry the queen. For adults, it's they mate with the queen. So a queen bee, when she emerges from um, her queen cell, she goes on a mating flight and the queen bee will only mate once in her lifetime. And what's interesting is there's these areas up in the sky called drone congregation areas. And they're kind of like single bars for bees. And so the, the males are up there flying around looking for a virgin queen. And so because of that, that's why they have these giant eyes. And you can see it in the photo, but they, it looks like the bees are wearing goggles. And that's so they can spot the, the, the queens when they come in. When a queen is up there, she will mate with up to 24 drones during that flight. So for some, it's kind of like a weekend in Vegas. But after she has her mating flight, the queen will return to the hive and she will have enough reproductive material to last her lifetime. Back to the drone bee, that after they mate, they actually, um, they, their reproductive organ snaps off and the drone bee falls to his death. So he only lives for a few months. And the, the beekeeping secret about drone bees is they don't have a stinger. So you can do magic tricks like this. And as you can see, it's a drone bee on my daughter. And because he doesn't have a stinger, there's no problems here. The last bee, and probably the only kind of bee you've ever seen if you've never been around a honeybee hive, is the worker bee. All worker bees are female. And bees are kind of like butterflies. And only instead of starting out as a caterpillar, they start as a larvae. And then they do go through a metamorphosis. So they will go change from that larvae, which kind of looks like um, a, a maggot or a slug, and then they build the mini cocoon and then they emerge as an adult bee. So that's why you never see uh, little baby bees flying around. And their jobs that they have all change depending on how old they are. So when they first emerge, their job is like kids, go back in and clean their room. So then they are called house bees and they, they clean up, they might build wax. Then they become a nurse bee, which is they take care of the babies. And one of the last jobs they have is to go forage. Bees forage for one of four things. Nectar to make honey, pollen, which is their protein, water, because all living things have to drink water. And four, they collect the sticky stuff on plants. And that sticky stuff is what, what they mix with enzymes and it's called propolis. At the peak of a season, there can be 60,000 bees in the hive and 56,000 of those would be the worker bees. And the interesting thing is that worker bees only live for six weeks. So quite a difference in life expectancy than a queen bee. So we call baby bees brood. And so this would be open brood, which is eggs and larvae. And if you look into each of those hexagonal cells, you're either going to see what looks like a tiny piece of rice, one per cell, or a little squiggly white C. So the, the, the little pieces of rice are the eggs. Um, it'll be an egg for three days, then it hatches into a larvae. The larvae start off extremely small and then they continue to grow. So uh, a big part of when we're doing inspections is we're looking for eggs because then we know that the queen is able to lay eggs and that she's been laying eggs in the past three days. Then as I said earlier that they um, will build like mini cocoons. So that's what's happening underneath each of these hexagons here. So this is what we call cap brood. Um, later in the slide, you're gonna see how this compares to honey. So you can see the difference. But if you look, it has a real fibrous kind of paper look to it. So keep that in mind when we look at honey. So here's some more of my favorite bee facts. Bees are the only invertebrate that can count to four and they also know the concept of zero. 
And there's many uh, animals, even mammals that don't understand the, uh, the concept of zero. Bees can't see the color red. Red to them looks black. And that's because they're more in the ultraviolet spectrum of light. And so they can see purple that we can't detect. So we call it bee purple. And it's kind of almost like at times that bees are seen in ultraviolet light. So even flowers look much different to them. And then bees communicate in two different ways, dances and smells that when they're describing or giving directions to their fellow worker bees, they'll use what's called the waggle dance. And it's in a figure eight. And in that figure eight, they will uh, give directions that have been shown to be accurate up to one meter away from the source. Um, and then smells or pheromones, everything in the hive gives off a different smell. So a lot of people know about the queen pheromone because that's what keeps the bees that they know that uh, the queen is in there, she's healthy, and that keeps the bees in a very mellow state. Um, but then the, the brood or babies also give off smells. And I always say, it's like, if you go to somebody's house that has one baby, that's going to smell much different than if you go to someone's house that has triplets or, you know, five or six kids. And so in, in a different way, but still the, the, the intensity of the smell is important. And last is that um, the guard bees who guard the hive and, and stand out front, that they have an alarm pheromone. And this is how they alert the hive. If um, there's something going on, if there's a predator, uh, are, are trying to get in the hive. And so when they let off that fear pheromone, it smells like bananas. And that's why a lot of beekeepers will tell you, don't eat bananas if you're gonna go out to your hive. So when it comes to beehives, that you can paint them any color you want, it really doesn't matter. They come in different uh, sizes and shapes. And there's, this is where you can really express yourself. And actually one of the good things about painting them differently, or as you can see in some of the hives, there's markings on the front, is that bees can then orient themselves into which, which is their house by the visual cues that you give it. It's the inside of a hive that is all very similar. And if you look in the boxes um, B, C, and D, you'll see how all of those numbered slats, which are called frames, line up. And there's a, there's a same size space between them. In 1851, in Philadelphia, Reverend Langstroth discovered what's called B space. It's three eighths of an inch. And what he discovered is that by leaving that space, then we can pull out those frames because if it's short, smaller than that, the bees will connect the comb and it's one big mess. So before Langstroth made that discovery, beekeepers had to use skeps. And you may have seen pictures of those. They look like upside down baskets. And to get the honey out of a skep meant you had to destroy all of the honeycomb and the hive to get, get the honey. By using hives with movable frames, then we're able to take the, the combs out, either inspect them from those pictures before to look at the brood, or if it's to extract honey, we can take out the frames, extract the honey, and put them back in. So it's really better for the bees. And it's especially because it takes bees to make honeycomb uses a lot of energy. Bees have to consume up to eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So by having movable comb and making the wax um, continue to be reused, then the bees don't have to spend so much resources building more comb. The entrance to this hive and, and most hives is at the bottom. So A, which is, um, we call it the bottom board, but there's always a little bit of a space so bees can come and go. Um, from the hive. So there's, there's lots and lots of a different equipment you can buy for beekeeping, but there's really only two that you need. Everything else is extra. Now I'm a gadget guy myself, so I have a lot of extra things, but the number one thing you need is a hive tool. This looks like a mini crowbar, and these two come in different sizes, colors, and shapes. And the reason you need this is because if you remember one of the things that bees scavenge or go and collect, is sticky stuff that they make into propolis. So propolis, they spackle everywhere and you, you can't just lift the covers up and down or pull out the frames because the bees have spackled those in place. And sometimes the, spackle, the, the propolis spackling is stronger than the wood. And so when you go to try to remove it, occasionally I'll break the piece of wood on the frame and the, and the propolis will still be stuck together. Um, but you couldn't even lift off the cover, the, the hive top, 
because it's so spackled on so strongly. The second equipment you need is a smoker. And the reason that beekeepers use smoker, if you remember, there's two ways they communicate. One is through smell. So when the fear pheromone, for example, if a bee lets that off, then that alerts the other bees. But if you use smoke and the kind of smoke that most bee beekeepers use are like pine needles or some other kind of natural substance, but it always has to be all natural. So by puffing smoke at them, then even if the honeybees, the guard bees let off that alarm pheromone, the rest of the bees can't detect it because the smell of the smoke. I always say to kids, it's like if they're in school and they hear the fire bell, they know to go outside. But imagine if the smoker was blocking it so nobody could hear the fire bell, then everybody would just keep doing what they're doing in the class. Now it's not needed, but most beekeepers have some sort of uh, protective equipment. Um, and this is just, this is a personal choice, meaning you have some beekeepers, like some old timers that'll say, oh, you don't need any of that. Just, just go in with just a baseball hat. And then you have other beekeepers on the other side that say, you should be covered from head to toe. My recommendation is, is whatever makes you feel comfortable is what you should wear. And the reason is, is that the more comfortable you are when you're in your hives, then the more relaxed you're going to be. And the more relaxed you are, then the, the, the slower you'll be able to move and take care of the bees. For me, I like to use just thin nitrile gloves. And the reason is, is that because when I'm in there, I want to be able to feel if I'm about to squish a bee. So as I'm, if I'm going to lift up, then through the nitrile gloves, I can, I can actually detect a bee because of their fur and actually, and bees are let off a lot of heat. So that way I'm more gentle when I'm in the hive. And that's important as well, because when a bee gets squished, they have more pheromones that says, hey, I got squished to put other, the other bees on high alert. Um, but yeah, so I, I either wear what you see here, which is a jacket and a veil, or sometimes I just wear the veil and, and that, that works for me. Where do you get all this bee stuff? So there are different companies out there. Um, in the US, the three biggest uh, are two of the biggest companies and one of my favorites. The first is Man Lake, which is the biggest for sure. On the other side is Dedant. Dedant is also the oldest uh, beekeeping supply company. As you can read on the cover, they've been around since the late 1800s. In the middle is um, a catalog by a company that I like called Better Bee. Better Bee is just north of Albany. So a lot of their uh, products are more tailored to the weather here uh, in the Northeast. Um, and they, they make a lot of high quality stuff. None of these companies is better than the other. So it's really just about which one you feel more comfortable buying stuff from. So how do you get bees? Well, there's two ways. It's either a nuke or a package. And nuke is short for nucleus. But so what it is, is that if you remember the picture where I had showed the inside of the hive, it was numbered from one to 10. So that's in every box, there's 10 hives. Um, so when you buy a nuke, instead of that, it's only four or five frames. But in that smaller, hence the word nuke for nucleus, in that smaller uh, hive, you have honey, you have brood, you have a queen who's laying eggs. So it's kind of, it's just a mini version. You put it into your big hive and then the bees will naturally spread and fill out the rest of the space. Um, and, and these are just different pictures of different nukes and boxes that they come in. The other way is a package. Packages are um, three pounds or 12,000 worker bees that are put into one of these uh, screen boxes. Then a queen bee is in a smaller cage that's put inside underneath that, the circle that you're seeing in the middle. And what that circle is, is uh, syrup, sugar syrup. And that's so that the bees have something to eat along their journey. Packages, now here's the funny part. Packages, you can legally ship these through the mail, both the postal service, UPS, and sometimes FedEx. And if you want to make good friends with your um, postman, have some bees delivered to your house. There's one other thing is um, swarms. You may have seen these uh, in the news because they usually... Um, are high profile, especially if it's in a city like New York City. And this, what swarms are is 
first let's talk about what they are, is if you remember in high school biology, a single cell organism will reproduce by splitting in half. And so that's what a colony of bees is doing. They create a new queen, and then the old queen and half the bees leave to go find a different house. And the reason is, is that honeybees think of like a computer program. And their, and their one program is spread genetics. So that's the whole reason they do everything. And so by swarming, they're able to double their genetics because they have two, two different homes. And swarms are very gentle. And the reason is, is that bees um, will sting to defend their hive or to defend their life. And so when a bee swarms, they no longer have a home. So that defensive behavior is gone. Additionally, before they swarm, they don't know when they're gonna eat again. So they eat as much honey. So they're kind of like us after a Thanksgiving dinner. The, um, <clears throat> and all, when you see a swarm, what a beekeeper will do is just collect them, like to use a cardboard box, shake the bees in. And as long as the queen is in that box, all the other bees will follow. It sounds like this is the best way to get bees. However, it, there, is, there is a big concern and that's do these bees have any, any diseases or any pests that can kill bees. And that leads us to what is killing the bees? You know, probably many of you are here because you've heard that bees are in trouble um, and you wanna learn more about it. So what is killing them is a varroa mite. This is a parasitic mite um, that leeches on to the developing bee and that's what it feeds on exclusively. Additionally, the varroa mite also is a vector for viruses and diseases. They only, the, the viruses only affect bees, so it's not about people. And just like we've experienced with this pandemic that of how easily things spread, that bees can't socially distance themselves. I've tried to get mine to wear pollen masks, but they refuse. And so because of that, the, the diseases the varroa ha carry spread quickly from hive to hive. And just a quick history that the varroa used to live on a different insect, which is the Asian bee. Then the 60s, it jumped species to our current our honeybees, which are called European honeybees. It came into the United States in 1987. It was in Florida. It, um, it came in on a ship. It, it infested uh, a commercial beekeeper who then drove his, he didn't know it, drove his hives up to Wisconsin. And that basically spread it across all 48 states. And now, um, Wherever there's honeybees, there's varroa mites. The only two places that there's an exception that there still isn't any varroa mites is Australia and Newfoundland. And what it looks like is like a tick, and you can see this with the human eye. Here is a picture of the mite next to a match just to give you an idea for scale. Here they are on bees. Um, the issue with trying to use if you see them on bees as a gauge is not accurate. And that's because 80% of the mites are living in the brood. So at best, you're only going to see 20%. And many times the mites crawl between the exoskeleton bee is like plates, you know, like an armored plates, like a knights, so that it hides between that. And so it makes it even more difficult to see. And I could give a three hour or more presentation just on mites. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of how dangerous they are and just ask you to memorize the beekeeping mantra of that the only good mite is a dead mite. Let's talk about the fun stuff, honey. So why do bees make honey? To have food for the winter. And what's really amazing when you think about this is that um, if, a, if a worker bee only lives for six weeks, and there, she's making, collecting nectar to make it into honey, that's not for her. That's for a few generations later of her sisters that will be alive during the winter to consume it. So just to pause for a second and, and, and think about that, that imagine spending your entire life to make food for a sister who isn't even born yet. So how much honey do bees need? Well, to make it through the winter, bees need about 80 pounds of honey. And here in the Northeast, they have to make all of that honey. This is just for themselves. They have to make all of that from April to July. And so as a beekeeper, it's important to um, make sure that the bees have made enough honey for themselves 
before we start taking it for us. So what I do is if you look at this picture, I paint my hives that the bees live in crazy colors. The, the boxes that I'm going to take honey from me, I always paint white. Um, and it's, it's funny too, that um, beekeepers, the, 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 the boxes for the bees are larger. Um, so we call those deep because they're deeper. So we call them deeps. And then the boxes that we put honey in are called supers. And that's because they're above the other boxes. So in this picture, the white boxes are supers. The, the ones with colors are deeps. Um, and part of the reason why supers are shorter is because of the weight. Um, if, you, if you think of the frame that is in the deep boxes, that those can weigh um, up to 10 pounds a piece with just honey weight. And what's interesting to think about that is that think of wax, like, you know, most of us, it's like a birthday candle and how easy it is to break. Well, the bees are such great architects that they figure out how to use wax that's as thick as, as um, like uh, construction paper. So it's not very thick at all, but they construct it in a way that it's strong enough to hold 10 pounds of dead weight. Amazing. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that, you know, you think of the hexagon that all honeycomb is made out of. The reason that bees use the hexagon shape is that if you took any size, let's say like a two inch by two inch square, and I said, you have to, you can use any shape you want, but make as many cells in that as you can. And hexagon is the most efficient. Additionally, when they build comb, they're building these cells on both sides. So instead of lining the, the cells up so they're straight through, they offset them because then the, the back of the, the honeycomb acts as a support for the other one. So again, it's just amazing when you think of um, how, how these are bugs, bees, and they're able to use such sophisticated architecture to make their homes. And the last thing I'll say on this is that, um, that think of when, when humans make a house and we want to make it straight up and down. It's called a plumb line. So we have a string and we put it on a weight. So for bees to do that, this is one of my favorite bee words, festooning. And what they'll do is they'll lock arms and legs. And then that means they're festooning, which is just to make a plumb line to show what's straight up and down. Some more interesting bee facts here that it takes 12 bees, their lifetime work to make a teaspoon of honey. So every time you sweeten your tea, that took 12 bees life to make it that way. And so that means if you work it out, it's just under 1200 bees to make one pound of honey. And for that one, so think of the jar you go buy at the supermarket or hopefully from your local beekeeper, that one pound of honey, the bees had to visit 2 million flowers. And for the bees to visit 2 million flowers meant that their, comply, their combined flight miles was 56,000. And that's twice around the equator of the earth. And that's for one pound. And as I said, that the bees have to make at least 80 pounds for themselves before they start making it for the beekeeper. So when you really start crunching the numbers, like my, um, my super hive that I had one year produced 100 pounds of honey for themselves and then gave me 240 pounds. So they, they produced, you know, so 340 pounds of honey times 2 million flowers or how many miles around the earth. It's just amazing. And then they did all that from April through July. So then when you break that down by day, then that meant that that hive was making over three pounds of honey a day to get those kind of quantity. So what do the flowers get from all this? You know, because <laughs> there's got to be something in it for them too. So the, the pollen in flowers is how flowers reproduce. It's how the, the, the male part meets the female part. And so remember when I said that bees have fur all over their body? So what happens is that when they're flying through the air, it's kind of the equivalent of like when we walk on a rug in the winter and we get that static charge. Only here, instead of a static like zap, when they land on the flower, they get covered in the pollen. And by getting covered in the pollen, then as they go flower to flower, they spread it. But what bees will also do is on their front legs, they have like built-in combs and then they'll groom themselves with those combs and they push all the pollen into these saddlebags on their rear legs. So if you look at the picture, the bee with those two big bright 
yellow balls. That's the pollen that they have groomed themselves and then and put it back there. And then they take that back to the hive. And the reason that bees collect pollen is because it's their protein source. And per ounce, there's more protein in bee pollen than there is in chicken breast. And just to make it a little bit more scientific, this shows that you know the bees covered in pollen, and then um, because of that, it can it can get the uh, the stick into the next flower stigma, which then is what um, gets the flower to to reproduce. Um, and additionally, if you you can kind of see in this picture that the that the bee is extending its tongue down to the nectar, and so bees have this giant straw-like tongue, and we call it a proboscis. So they stick out their straw tongue, they put it into the nectar of the flower, they suck it up, and then separate from their digestive system, they have what's called a honey gut. And that's what they use to transport the nectar back to the hive. And once they get to, to the hive, they pass it off to a receiver bee. So if you think of a warehouse, and that if, it, if a truck brings a, a, a bunch of goods to the warehouse, then they need people to unload the truck and to store the merchandise. So it's the same thing here that the bees are doing, that the foragers bring it back. So they're the trucks, and then they pass it off to the receivers, just like they would in the warehouse. And then the receivers, depending on the size of the hive, either the, that bee itself will move the nectar to the proper place in the honeycomb, or it'll go receiver to receiver to receiver till it finally goes into the honeycomb. And what's interesting is that if you spill honey, bees are meticulously clean. And that's part of the reason why we can eat honey as well as use their wax in cosmetics and in medical purposes. So if you spill some honey in the hive, the bees will get around it and then they're all sucking it up into their honey guts. And then so they can place it in the comb where it belongs again. And um, <clears throat> some more honey facts is that its taste and color is 100% dependent on what flowers the bees went to and collected that nectar from. So each plant, the honey will taste a little bit different. When nectar comes in, it's 80% water. And so part of what bees do to convert the nectar to honey is they're, they're think of like maple syrup when we make that. So the bees are boiling off the water to bring it down to, to less than 19%. Um, nectar is also sucrose. Like if you took table sugar and stirred it in with water, that's very similar to what nectar is. But what bees do is they have all these enzymes in their honey gut, and they'll actually break that sucrose down into simple sugars of fructose and glucose. And what's interesting is that the enzyme, when it creates the glucose, there's a, a natural byproduct that's producing hydrogen peroxide. And so because honey um, is a super saturated liquid, which means it it's so has so little moisture or, or water in it, and because of the, um, the amount of sugars that are in it, and because it has hydrogen peroxide, is why honey never spoils. So they had once found honey in the Egyptian tombs that was over 3,500 years old, and it was still edible. It's the only food that would be that edible, and to this day, I still want to meet the guy that tasted the 3,500-year-old 3, year honey. So how do we know when it's done? So what, 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 the bees do is when it all went through all the steps, then they produce wax and they put it over the top. It's like they cap it. And that's what we call this, this layer of wax cappings. And what I think is interesting is that as humans, we have to have a special gauge that we can look and see the moisture content of the honey, but bees who are bugs just instinctually know. And then that's when they cap it. So then um, when a beekeeper sees this, and then this is the screen I was going to show you about before to show how much different honey looks in brood. And again, see how the honey, you can tell it's wax, it's kind of shiny. And then the brood has more papery and a, and a darker color. Um, so it is quite easy to tell what's what in a hive. But once it's capped and it's ready to be harvested, then we bring the boxes back home. When you harvest, you have to do it inside because the honeybees will be able to find it if you tried to do this outside. And so we get the bees off of the honey. Um, there's several different ways to do that. I use what's called a fume board. And so I put an all natural essential oil mix onto like a felt top. And to that, the bees, it just stinks so bad that they leave. 
So it'd be kind of like if a smelly person got in the subway car, everyone goes to the next car. So that's what the bees are doing. They just keep walking down. So once I get the boxes home, the first step is to take that, um, that layer of wax off or on cap it. So I like to use what's called an on-capping fork, and I just guide that along uh, the top of the hive. I save this wax, as most beekeepers do, because this is the stuff that we make our lip balms from, our hand creams, and our candles. And I make all of that myself. And my lip balm is better than Bert's. The next step is we take it once it's on capped and we put it into what's called an extractor. An extractor is essentially a big drum that just all the honey flies out of um, and that's able to collect it. You don't have to spin it fast. Um, my, my girls have spun the extractor when they were three years old and they were able to get it to the speed that it needed to be. So after of doing this through a few frames that honey accumulates at the bottom of the extractor. So you just open up that valve, which we call a gate. And then once the, the honey pours out, it goes through this metal strainer. The strainer is there just to catch any wax particles um, that may be in the honey. And that's it. So I like to stress that raw honey is liquid. And when, and as long as it, you know, you just put it through a strainer, you don't need to do anything else. So you, you have the strainer over a five gallon bucket. And then once the bucket is filled, you just put a lid on it. And then that honey will be completely fine until you're ready to consume it. Or I should say ready to bottle it. So I'll take those five gallon buckets and five gallons of honey equals 60 pounds. So it is much heavier than water. Um, so I pour that honey into my uh, bottling, some people call it a bottling tank. For me, it's a bottling bucket. Uh, again, I have one of those gates that we call. This one kind of reminds me of a soft serve ice cream dispenser. And uh, just fill up the bottles one at a time, put them on a cap, put a cap on again, because as long as it's capped, it lasts forever. And then it's ready to sell. And like I said, I also make my own lip balm and hand cream. And then I just briefly wanted to tell you uh, about my book, uh, Be People and the Bugs They Love. Uh, here's what some of the reviews have said. Harlan Coben, who's a New York Times bestselling author. And uh, for those that have Netflix, you might've seen some of his shows. Um, but he's, and I love this quote because it's filled with so many dad jokes. And he says, it's the bee's knees and it's getting a ton of buzz. Be smart people and read this unbelievably interesting look at the quirky world of beekeeping. The New York Times, when they reviewed it, said it was an achievement to convey so much knowledge so accessibly without seeming overbearing. And I inter interspersed useful facts with my passion and a successful funny book. The San Francisco Book Review, the reviewer said that this ranks as among the best written books he's ever reviewed. And it has great humor, allegory, and uh, tremendous knowledge and background of beekeeping. And the bee people are a weird and fascinating lot. And I dug deeply into that uh, for a fascinating read. And the thing about the bee, my book, Bee People, is that it, it does have all these facts that I've talked about today, but it goes more into the stories of uh, the type of person that keeps bees and all the funny things that happen uh, to the people that willingly choose to be around stinging insects. And this book is available worldwide. So wherever you buy your books, you can get a copy of Bee People. The uh, paperback just published last week. And I thank you very much. Time for questions. That was so much fun. <laughs> I loved that event. Um, you have some amazing facts. I was blown away by like everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have some questions coming in. Um, let's start with Paulo asks, don't the wasps have any positive role near the hive? Ex example, eating the dead bodies. So, so in nature, wasps do have a, a purpose, you know, positive reason around a beehive. No, because actually what, um, especially yellow jackets will try to do is since they're omnivores, they'll try to sneak into a hive to steal the bee babies to eat. So as a beekeeper, we don't like to see any kind of wasp or yellow jacket around our hives. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> um, Denise asked, what time of 
year do the queens mate? Good question. That time is now. So when at, when we see swarm season is also when queens are mating because the 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 hive has produced uh, a new queen to go out and mate. So essentially, in our neck of the woods, the northeast, that season would be um, I'm going to call it late April through June. Um, there's there's an old poem that I can't ever remember that says like a, a swarm in May is worth a bale of hay. And in July, it's not worth a dime <laughs> or something it's a like good that. Good way to remember it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jean asked, if you buy a beehive, will the bees come or do you need to buy the bees too? You have to buy them separately. So when I showed those catalogs, um, that's just for bee stuff. And I should say, you can also buy bees through some of those catalogs, but theoretically, those are just to where you buy your equipment. Um, my number one piece of advice, if you're looking to get started, is to find a local bee club because your local bee club will be able to instruct you on where's the best place to get bees locally for you. A little plug for that. Maybe Meetup can help you with your local bee club. There you <laughs> Take go. Take a look on Meetup. <laughs> um, someone else asked, how feasible is beekeeping in the city? So, so New York does have, New York City has its own beekeeping club. It became legal to keep bees in the city approximately 12 years ago. Um, and there's, there's hundreds of beekeepers currently keeping hives in the city. The trick is that um, the placement of the hives, that it, you know, it's great to have on roofs, but you can't be on like a super high skyscraper because then if you think of a bee like a plane and when it has nectar or pollen, um, it's like a, it's like a plane trying to get up with too much weight yeah. on it. So the bees have a trouble getting up, but just a few stories up. Um, it's not a problem at all. And an advantage of keeping bees on a roof is then you don't have other pests that you have to worry about. So like, like skunks are a big issue for keeping bees. There's a lot to think about. <laughs> um, Mark asked, have you ever used a horizontal hive? I have not. Um, that um, and if you're if you're just starting out, I am going to recommend that you start with a Langstroth hive because it's just most people use those and it's just it's easier to learn on with a with a horizontal hive um, that a lot of those are which is also they're called a top bar hive and top bar hives were primary are primarily used in um, like more less developed countries. Um, in Africa, they, they take those and they suspend them from trees. So then that way, the, the, the motion of the ground, the bees can't detect. But with those, because it, the, your, the bees need to build more wax and it can be trickier to get started using that. And then uh, anecdotally, it's been reported that those are harder. It's harder to overwinter bees in a horizontal hive. Um, now, I, have I worked bees? I mean, and worked is when you go into the hive. In a horizontal hive? Yes, I actually in, uh, took classes that taught us both. Cindy asked, why does my raw honey get less liquid or yes. crystallized? So the reason is, is because it's 100% honey. So back when I talked about honey being a super saturated liquid, what happens only with natural honey, so it's a good thing it happens, is the glucose molecules pull out of the liquid and then they attach to each other. And that's what gives it that grainy taste. Now, what's interesting is their European style honey, creamed honey, um, is a solid. And, and with that, the texture is more like vanilla icing. And the reason that that's able to happen is that the beekeeper controls the crystallization process, keeping the crystals small so it has that smooth flavor. Here's the tip that take your jar if it crystallizes and put it in a wa very warm but not boiling bowl of water, never microwave boiling bowl or very warm bowl of water. If you have a sous vide, um, set it for 104 degrees. That's key. And then the honey will re liquefy. Also in summer, you know, put the jar in your car because you know how hot it gets on inside a car and that'll actually re liquefy your honey. Hmm, that's good to know. Um, Jill asked, so is the vor Varroa mite the reason for colony collapse? Yeah, the, the varroa, varroa is the key to everything. 
um, with colony collapse, which only lasted for a few years, I'd like to add, um, that and they, it was more of like a perfect storm of a lot of different things, but absolutely that Varroa played a, a key in that. And to describe what the difference between colony collapse disorder is and just regular death is that think of a, a big apartment building in New York City and imagine in every apartment, it's, there's food, there's babies, but there's no adults. And so you would go into a hive and you would see that it had plenty of honey, it had plenty of brood, but there's no worker bees, no drones. And that's what colony collapse disorder was. So like I said, only lasted for a few years and that's different than uh, colony die off now. How is that different? I'm just curious. Well, it's that that with Varroa, like you'll you'll have if if, if a colony dies, um, all the dead bees will, will have fallen to the floor of the hive. So you'll you'll see the the dead oh. dead bees, and then with colony collapse, there was no they weren't anywhere to be found. Huh. Wow. Uh, we got another question about honey. Hey, Harley asked, what causes honey to spoil? The only way you could make make honey not honey is if you left it uncapped. So then moisture in the air would go into the honey because honey is um, it it's a super saturated liquid, which means that the ratio to solid molecules to to liquid molecules is isn't right. So the honey would actually absorb moisture from the air, which would bring it um, above that nineteen percent, which then means that. Uh, yeasts and things can grow in it and that's when it'll it'll ferment or spoil oh that's an interesting thing to think about because i have honey upstairs in my house and i thought it was spoiled but maybe i just left the cap open <laughs> <laughs> um nick asked my favorite part of honey is the comb how do you save the comb if you spin it so that when i when i spin it then I just take those um, frames out and the wax is fine. So I'm not spinning it super fast. That's why, like I said, that my, um, my girls, when they were three, uh, they were able to spin it because it doesn't have to go that fast. You're just doing it enough, kind of like a merry-go-round that kids push around in a playground. It just has to be continuous. And then the wax I can reuse. But if you're saying that you like um, honey that is still in the comb and that's how you buy it, then that's a different process. So I would still have that same frame, you know, a similar frame, but like my frame is reinforced with wires that they build the comb around in the, the, the honeycomb that you buy to consume, there is no wire. So when I pull it out and see it capped and I just take it, I would take it back and cut it into chunks and then sell it that way. Do you sell home honeycomb? I don't. Um, oh. It's a, it's a different process and it's mm -hmm. just, and it's, without going into too much detail, it's a different way of getting your bees to make honey. And so I like to be consistent. Uh, one interesting fact about um, honey in the comb is they used to call it farmer's gum because you could chew on it. And then after you had the honey flavor, you could just continue to chew on the wax. Oh, cool. Veronica asked, what is the best climate to be a bee farmer? Well, see, so that's what, what's amazing to me about honeybees is so honeybees are not native to North America. So they, they, the, all the European colonists brought their bees with them when they came over here. And so naturally occurring honeybees live in Spain, in Italy, as well as in Sweden, Norway, and Finland. So if you think of the diversity of climates, just in, in, in that little segment of Europe, you can see that there really isn't a perfect climate. It's just more of that you have to tailor your beekeeping depending on where you live. Hmm. And there's different there's different pluses and minuses of both areas. So like mm -hmm. with, you know like in the in the colder climate, it it you might have a shorter honey season, but because of the extreme cold, it kills a lot of the pests. That um, in oh. a warmer climate, like so like Florida would have a lot more pests, mm -hmm. but, they, you know, the, but they would have a longer season versus here in the Northeast. So there's positive and, and negatives to both. Yes. Um, Court asked, what can people who aren't able to become beekeepers do to support the bee population? Great question. Thank you for asking that. 
So number one is find your local beekeeper. If you through a Google or you know looking at a bee club, I guarantee you that you have a beekeeper closer than you think. Buy that person's honey because by supporting your local beekeeper, you're supporting their ability to have money to continue to raise bees, first and foremost. Second is there's plantings you can do. And if you're going to plant for bees, you want to, you want to plant like in three foot um, bushes of, or bundles of, bee, of, of flowers because bees are generalist and they're more likely to go to a big giant cluster of, of flowers than they would if they're planted individually. Last is that with the plantings that you do, try to find stuff that blooms in August and September. The reason is that so many uh, plants that we have, um, especially ornamentals, bloom in the spring, and there's very few plants that bloom in the late season. So if you're planting those, then that gives the bees a way to fuel up and have the honey they need to get through the winter. That's really smart. Um, Ron asked, do bees know which is their hive? Do they always go back to the same one? So the rule is yes. So remember when I showed the different colors of the hives and I had the shapes. So that's why you're, you're providing visual cues. Um, and additionally, so bees have like a built-in GPS system and they navigate by the polarity of the sun. So that means even if they don't see the sun, that they know its location in the sky. And that's how they're able to find their way back and forth. Wow. These are so smart. I don't think we give them enough credit. Yeah. Um, Jim asked, I've heard it said that bees can recognize individual human faces from photos. Do you have any information on this? That, that was a study that was done that they were able to show that bees could distinguish um, and recognize different faces. However, that doesn't mean that your bees, it's like a dog that recognizes its owner. You know, then that I would say like, you know, a dog, you know, gives you love back. It'll lick mm -hmm. your face. Or if you have a cat, you can cuddle with on the couch occasionally. Bees aren't going to do that. So even though they know your face, that if there's a problem, they're going to let you know about it. Yeah. And that's why I say like that beekeepers are like, if you think about it, because they're taking care of this organism that could potentially sting them, that, that connected to the desire to do that is a real nurturing gene. Um, meaning that you have to want to take care of something that's not necessarily going to give you love back. Yeah. And, and because of that is why I say beekeepers make such great friends. Um, <laughs> I've met so many of my best buddies through beekeeping and um, why, you know, we tend to help each other and just be good, good to have around. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, Claudia asked, how do you know how much honey to extract and how much to leave for the bees? Good question. So the one of the reasons why I paint my hives different colors and all of my honey boxes, the supers all white, is I only extract honey from the white supers. So in, in the, the, the top deep of the bees, that if I know each frame is 10 pounds, I know that they have to have at least eight filled before I can start taking honey for myself. So the short answer is I don't take it from their box. The longer answer is everything I just said, especially mm -hmm. that I'm able to guess how much honey they have based on how many uh, frames of they filled up. Got a lot of questions here. <laughs> People keep submitting. Um, Gary asked, when is the best time of year to start a hive for beginners? Good question. So most places give you, remember I said there's two ways to get bees, either the nukes or the packages. So those tend to come in April. So April is kind of uh, when new colonies start. So between now and next April, what I'd recommend is join your local bee club, take some uh, bee classes that can go in a lot deeper into all this information I provided. There's great books you can get. Uh, one of them happens to be bee people and the bugs they love to kind of give more information and then getting those catalogs from those companies. So you can start kind of looking at all the different stuff that you could buy and figure out what you want your equipment to get. You would um, order your bees starting in December. So through December through February, March is when most places take orders for their bees. And then in that same time period is when you would build your hives. So by the time April rolls around, 
you have the physical hives in your yard ready to go. You have the basic knowledge to get started. You have a club that can help you. And then so when the bees come, you you're, have a very strong foundation to have success. Awesome. It's so interesting having so many people wanting to get into this, which is great. Yes. Um, Robert asked, how much of a problem are murder hornets? They're not. Um, they sound scary. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, uh, um, so, and, and I'm talking about in the U S I should say, I want to be clear. I'm answering that question as, uh, in, in here in North America, because in, um, they're originally from Asia where they can be, um, really significant. And I know that there's, uh, they're also tracking them in different countries in Europe and they have bait hives to catch them there. So speaking specifically about the U.S., that that there's been a few um, queens that they've caught in um, western Washington state, but they seem to have, there's no signs that they've spread beyond what they've been able to capture so far. Uh, so at this point, there really isn't a high probability that they're going to be a large problem. Here on the East Coast, for, for decades, if not longer, we've had what's called the European hornet, which is also pretty darn big. Um, and so what, during the murder hornet scare that all of us were getting lots of calls about the European hornet. Um, so, which, which you know, um, not, not to the same extent as the Asian, AKA murder hornet, but still can, can, can be a cause for concern. So we have one more question. Um, LK asked, I live in the Denver area and have a very shady yard. What flowers can I grow in shade to support bees, even if I don't have hives? Yeah, I, I, my plant knowledge is very limited. Um, so I apologize for not knowing specifically, but I'll bet you, you could find, um, a, a local nursery that specializes in, um, planning for native pollinators that would be able to help you. Sounds good. So um, thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to put your links in the chat once again. So um, I just put in his the link to Frank's book, his website, and his Instagram. So go check him out. And thank and you again, everybody, for spending your um, Thursday afternoon listening to someone talk about bugs. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting. Um, but before we go, I'm just going to share a few more slides. So um, a new organizer app has been developed that provides organizers with all the tools they need to painlessly schedule events and manage their groups on the go. So if you'd like to participate in our beta, just pull out your phone and scan the QR codes. The top QR code is for iOS and the bottom is for Android. So I'll just give you all a second to scan. Okay, and we also have a podcast with our CEO um, called Keep Connected. And if you'd like to take a listen, just scan this QR code. I highly recommend it. We have some awesome guests on. Um, so yeah, I'll give you another second to scan. And just as a reminder, you can view a recap of this event in a few days on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com slash blog. Thank you again, Frank, for being here. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Yeah, be well and buzz on everyone. Yeah. <laughs>